Good morning. Wow. Everyone's settling down. Hi, Doug. Everyone's settling down very quickly here today. Um, everyone's hearts must be uh, very anxious and eager to worship our uh, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So uh, welcome to everybody. If you happen to be visiting with us today, a very special welcome. And we encourage you to stay after the service so that we can get to know you a little bit better. Uh, pretty friendly group here. Um, also, there are welcome packets to the right as you exit the doors in the rear of the church where you can get to know a little bit about us that way as well. So um, we'd be more than happy to chat with you about any questions that you have about the church and the life of our church and our mission. Um, there's a lot going on in the life of the church, uh, which you'll find both in your bulletin and in the PCF newsletter. Um, we're just going to share a few of the opportunities to participate in the life of the church in our community, um, as well as opportunities to deepen your personal understanding of and relationship with God and the saving grace of the gospel. We know how critical it is to reach children with the gospel. As Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of heaven. So to that end, our Bible Venture Vacation Bible Camp is coming up, and it's a key way for kids to deepen their relationship with Jesus, and for some even perhaps to meet him for the first time. So many volunteers come together to make this a fun and gospel-centered week for the kids, but we'd love it if everyone could participate, even if you're unable to volunteer at the camp itself. And so to that end, um, we're now passing out supply cards. Uh, Vicki Trehe will be bringing those around, um, and one of the younger trees. Um, so please look through the basket and take a card to help provide needed craft and snack supplies for the camp. And included on the cards is what is needed, the date it is needed, and any special information such as uh, nut-free for those with allergies. There is a bin in the foyer for the non-perishable supplies to be dropped off. And if you have any questions, you can contact Vicki Trehe. Anything else with that, Vicki? I think that covers it. Good. Awesome. <laughs> we also invite you to join us um, only six days from now to participate in the Pepperell 4th of July Parade. And this is such a great time for us to don our PCF Blue t-shirts, although wearing the t-shirts is not a requirement to participate. Smiles are. Um, and show Pepperell how much we and Jesus love this community. Um, we'll be decorating the float on Friday night, uh, June 30th, at 5.30 5 p.m. right here. And all are encouraged to come and help and encourage. Um, as an extra enticement, pizza will be served. And then on Saturday, July 1st, the float will be on Townsend Street in Pepperell at 8.30 a.m. for the parade lineup. So if you wish to walk or ride on the float, meet at the float by 9.30 a.m. on Townsend Street. The parade itself kicks off at 10 a.m. You can park um, at PCF and walk to the float. And there's still time right up until Saturday to bring hard candy to throw from the float. I know I talk about that a lot, but um, it really is a great way to connect and show our love to the, to the Pepperell community. And shortly you'll be hearing details um, about service Sunday and July 2nd, so I'm not going to be going into that. Um, we encourage parents to take your free copy of Paul Tripp's parenting book if you're planning to join us for our upcoming parenting discussions on July 30th and September 17th. You can find the books on a table in the rear of the church through the doors. We also want to remind you that our summer schedule is starting up on July 9th with services at 8.30 and 10.30 with prayer in between. And then I uh, also wanted to share that we just had our, our all-church gathering and want to send our congratulations to church clerk Cheryl Wood, our assistant treasurer Lisa Manley, and deacon Gavin Price-Lewis on their being re-elected to additional terms in their services, and to Steve Poirier on being elected as our next treasurer. We're very, very grateful for their service to our church. And also at the all-church gathering, the members unanimously approved our 2023-2024 budget. So um, off to a great start in the new church year. As we enter into our time of worship, we may have come here today with anxious thoughts, um, sad things in our lives, painful things in our lives. 
And we just, uh, you know, one of the reasons we come together is to put those things at the foot of the cross and to lift our heads from the earthly challenges and painful situations we face and take heart worshiping our God surrounded by our brothers and sisters in Christ. So to that end, I'd like you to uh, uh, listen to these words from Psalm 42, verses 1 through 5. As a deer plant pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God, which is where we are, with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. So let us be encouraged about God's faithfulness and promises in this responsive reading. I will read the part of the leader and invite you to join in as the congregation from Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And a scripture reading from Romans. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he has seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And dear Lord and King, we are fervent in hope. We are grateful in praise, and we are encouraged by your faithfulness through our joys and our tribulations. We want to give you our all in worship now and be filled with the joy that comes from drawing close to you. Let our praises reach to the heavens. In Jesus' name, amen. Give thanks to the Lord and God with your whole hearts. Glorify his name forever, for great is his steadfast love toward us. Please rise. commands all the hosts of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what other beauty demands such praises Majesty rules with justice, only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever. Worship a whole. 
cross could rescue me from my failing. Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father?
Father God, even the greatest human minds could not conceive or invent your plan for our salvation. Jesus, eternal Lamb of God, you are both the message of the gospel and its messenger. You lived your message here on earth through infinite compassion, giving your life to insult, torture, and death that we may be redeemed, ransomed, freed. Blessed are you, Father God, for masterminding this plan. Eternal thanks to you, Jesus, our sacrificial lamb, for opening the way to God. We praise you, Holy Spirit, for imprinting the gospel on our souls. Let it be heard, acknowledged, professed, and lived by your power. Holy Spirit, bring us to the cross daily to seek the glory of Christ's sacrifice. Strip us of every pretense that we can be righteous by our own actions. Unite us with Christ and remind us that nothing can separate us from Christ's love.
if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Amen. Please be seated. Father, this morning we do affirm that we love you, triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and even more, we recognize and receive your greater love for us. Father, we pray for Shayla the Grand as she leaves this Wednesday for a two-week mission trip to Haiti, teaching CPR, first aid, distributing medical supplies to those impacted by earthquakes and disasters. And we pray that Shayla will be able to share the love of Christ with the people of Haiti. May each one of us overflow your love to those around us. And we think of this coming Saturday with the town parade as we can do that together and then service Sunday a week from this morning. And we think of all summer as we have opportunities to serve and love those in our lives. Having received your love may we overflow it to those around us. Father, this morning, I want to name and pray against a mighty enemy of our souls, namely fear. This past week in our Bible reading plan, we read 1 Samuel 28, verse 3, which says that King Saul obeyed you by putting the mediums and necromancers out of the land. And then just four verses later, we read that Saul sent his servants to find a medium he could consult. And the question was how he could be led so quickly into disobedience. And you showed us the answer right in between in verse 5, which says that when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. It was his fear that led him to reverse direction and disobey you. So, Father, we confess that we fear all kinds of things as well. We fear the opinions of other people. We fear discomfort and inconvenience. We fear disruption of our schedules. We fear health issues. We fear death. We fear financial struggles. We fear for our children. We fear childlessness. We fear job loss. We fear rejection, we fear loneliness, we fear failure, we fear pain. And so often we have allowed our fears to lead us away from you rather than toward you. We've allowed our fears to paralyze us and prevent us from obedience. We've kept our mouths shut rather than sharing the gospel or taking an ethical stand or helping the helpless. We found security in money or possessions or comfort rather than in you. Lord, we hear your command in Isaiah 41.10, fear not, be not dismayed. And we rejoice that those commands are surrounded by and grounded in your promises. Fear not, for I am with you, you say. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We hear your words to us in Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers... They shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. We hear your words to us in 2 Timothy 1.7. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Father, please may we fear you, and may you free us from our other fears. Make us bold and loving and sacrificially kind and willing to risk for the sake of your name. 
Give us the joy of knowing that you're with us and that we can trust you. Free the children of our church from their fears and the teens and the young adults and the middle-aged and seniors. Strengthen those who are facing health crises and feel afraid. Free the singles of our church from their fears and the married couples. Free men and women. You are our God. You are our Father. Reassure us of your presence and make us bold like Daniel and Esther and Ruth and David and Jonathan and like Jesus himself. We need your strengthening, Lord. We need promises. We need hope because we are so often fearful. So strengthen us through your word this morning and allow the gospel to flood afresh into our hearts, filling us with gladness and joy. And we pray this for the sake of your name so that we, your empowered people, can testify to you and live for you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Before I send the kids out to Children's Church, I'm going to have Brian Fitzgerald come. Brian is leading our service Sunday effort next Sunday morning, week from this morning. And Brian's going to tell us a bit more about what that will entail. So Brian, come on up. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for that prayer. That was great. Um, okay, so um, Brian Fitzgerald, for those of you that don't know me, um, I've been coming here for about two years since my family and I moved to the area. My wife, Rachel, and her three kids are actually driving out to upstate New York uh, this morning to visit family. Um, so pray and safe drive for them, but um, flying solo today. Um, anyway, so I'm here to introduce Service Sunday, um, and uh, just... Before I do that, um, I just want to say uh, this body of believers and this church, uh, as a family, we feel so richly blessed to be a part of, and I just want to thank you truly for the growth and fellowship that um, this church has been for me and for my family since we've been here, so thank you. Um, Service Sunday, so, um, you know, right up there on on the first slide, we exist to be a Jesus-centered community in Pepperell, seeking go- speaking gospel words and doing gospel works to display the worth of God to the world. So that's the heart of it, right? And we heard that. So um, for us, you know, in moving here the last couple of years, uh, we always have our own home task lists, right? And uh, mine feels like it's ever-growing. Um, I'm not sure about yours, but there's always something breaking or appealing or leaking or something. And, uh, you know, a lot of times it's, it's easy for me personally to focus on the things that I have in my own sphere to uh, fix and work on and do. And, um, and, and it's easy often for me to do that rather than think about my neighbors or talk to them and kind of stay in my own, in my own sphere of those sort of things. So um, uh, I can say without a doubt, it never gets accomplished. It's always this running task list. And this... Uh, Next Sunday, we have a chance to really, you know, in contrast, be out serving other people, really take the focus off ourselves, you know, and practice for doing this all the time, Um, to be intentional as a church, to uh, use our time, our energy to serve the community together. And um, I can say without a doubt, I've never regretted taking time and not worrying about my own task list and putting it towards other people's needs, especially people that need help um, because they're you know, physically unable or um, just more than they can do uh, themselves. So what a great chance for us to um, be Christ to those uh, in the community. Um, So, um, and and really beyond the tasks themselves, we have a chance to talk to people as well, right? And I don't want to miss that opportunity that we have um, to really just be encouraging to people that maybe are discouraged um, and uh, also a chance that as a family of believers to get to know each other better as we work alongside each other 
and um, do some th fun things out in the community. So, okay. Um, so I, I'm really following suit with what's been done in past years. So you won't notice much difference here. Um, you know, it's been done well and um, no reason to kind of uh, break too much from that. So uh, if we want to go to the next slide, this is the, the schedule for next Sunday. Um, we're going to be visiting um, homes of four seniors, or three seniors and one veteran's home in the community. Um, and we're going to be cleaning up the town fields after the fireworks and some, I think, vendors, uh, food and stuff that they're going to be having, uh, the parade route, and uh, there will be an indoor activity here in the PCF sanctuary uh, for people that either can't or uh, uh, would rather do uh, an indoor activity. Okay, so we'll go through these different projects we're going to do. And I can do this again next week in more detail. So when we kind of go out, um, we know what we're doing and we have it fresh in our mind. But there's, there's four homes, as I said. The Schofield House is a veteran's home um, over off Heald. And, boy, they do need help. We're, they're asking us to help paint a porch there, clean up some landscape beds that are just tremendously overgrown. So it's really just taking the time that we have to apply it in whatever way we can. Uh, we'll have, we, we do need some equipment for all of these sites, so um, there's, before I go much further, there's sign-up sheets in the back for each of these projects. Please sign up, and if you can bring or lend something that day uh, for the equipment needed, it would be great. So if you could just check the box and put down what you can bring of the tools that are needed. They're on the sheets as well, so you don't have to remember them here. But um, if we could, if we could get that porch uh, painted and the weeds um, pulled from those landscape beds, just kind of general landscaping cleanup around the front of this place, that would be a start for them, a help. Okay, um, so we're looking for at least five people there. Next one, just go through these. Um, Lorraine Christman's home, this is over off Mason, on Mason Street, the mobile home area, um, needing four people there, same kind of stuff, mostly outdoor landscaping, trimming, weeding, that type of stuff. So a lot of overgrown area. There is a little bit of poison ivy, I noticed, at this house. So if you're resistant, you have skin that doesn't get affected by poison ivy, please sign up for this one. We need you. Uh, if you do, maybe stay away. Um, and we'll keep going. Two more homes, um, Irene Letty's home. Um, and as I, on each of these, we have a leader. So if you have any questions during the week, you can get a hold of me, certainly. But these leaders will be kind of point person next week on the day of to kind of lead to go there and make sure we do a good job at each house. So there's some things needed here. You can read them. Uh, we do need a lawnmower that's unique about this house. Just the one that they have is not working. Um, so if you could bring one there, that would be really helpful. Okay, we'll keep going. Um, I'll leave this one. This is Vanessa McDevitt's home. Um, same kind of stuff. So really just cutting back overgrowth, things people can't take care of. Um, on their own, so looking for the same kind of thing, um, just general cleanup of overgrowth. And then there'll be the town field cleanup, so uh, debris, pickup, firework stuff that gets left over, and any trash from vendors and stuff. Um, I think in past years, it's definitely been the, the one field up behind uh, Varnum Brook School, but then there's another vendor area where there's a lot of trash that can be left over as well. We are trying to coordinate um, also with, um, I think the Boy Scouts do some of this cleanup, so we'll make sure we're working in tandem with them on that. So Dan Sentinar will be leading that. And then Stephen will be leading the parade route cleanup. Um, standard picking up all the candy wrappers and everything like that that get left behind that day. Um, and we'll provide the gloves and trash bags there um, to use. So you don't, no, those don't need to be brought. But we need a number of people. More people to kind of spread out for the fields and the parade route are helpful. Many hands make light work. So seeing you know, all those little wrappers and stuff. Um, so, and then the last activity, um, really be the indoor, uh, Rachel, and my wife will be helping to organize this, uh, throughout the week, but really, um, there's a number of veterans at the, um, Schofield home. We're going to try to bless and, uh, other service members in the area, um, by making some gift, uh, car, car, some cards, gift baskets, uh, maybe some individually wrapped kind of like baked goods and things like that. So, um, that would be really helpful if you could sign up for any of those types of items. Okay, and then last um, slide, remember to wear your T-shirt and uh, sunscreen if it's sunny that day. If it is rainy, you know, um, we'll, we'll pray we get good weather, but uh, we, we do have the indoor pieces of the paint and the indoor here. Uh, if it's light rain, we'll probably still go and get it all done. If it's torrential or thunderstorms or something like that, we'll have to regroup and see what we're going to do. 
and then the picnic afterwards. So we'll come back here um, and then have some time to just fellowship together here. Uh, everyone centered back here. Bring meat to grill for your family and a side dish to share and uh, a place to sit outside, hopefully, if it's nice. So that's the plan for the day. Um, please, if you have any questions or input, happy to receive it. So just get a hold of me. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. So that's this coming Friday is preparation for the float uh, right here at the church Friday afternoon, e early evening, and then pizza together. That's what Ann announced earlier. Saturday is uh, walking in the town parade, celebrating with the town. And next Sunday is service Sunday. So opportunities to celebrate with our town, opportunities to serve the town in which God has placed us. And I hope you'll join us for those. All right, kids, you can go now if you're second grade or younger, to Children's Church. And I invite all of you to open up a Bible to John chapter 11. And raise your hand in the air if you need a Bible. And our ushers, Gavin or Cheryl, will walk up the aisle and hand you a Bible if you just keep your hand in the air. John chapter 11. And I'm going to begin by reading verses 45 through 57 of John 11. We're, we're continuing our sermon series through the Gospel of John. And coming up toward in the next few weeks, taking a break, we'll step back from John's gospel and uh, I'll preach on some psalms over the summer, and then we'll come back and in the fall finish the gospel of John, the second half of John's gospel. John chapter 11 this morning, verses 45 through 57. So here is the word of God. I'm going to read it, and then we'll seek to understand and apply it. John 11, starting in verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation." But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. And this is the word of God. All during my growing up years, my father was a pastor and we lived in about a hundred year old parsonage with a dirt basement and an attic that got, got crazy hot in the summers. And when you entered the front door of this old parsonage, uh, you, you would come to a hallway that had, it was, a, it was a kind of a beautiful curving wall that would curve around. If you kept walking into the hallway, deeper into the hallway, you'd curve around to get to the dining room. If you took an immediate right, you'd come into the living room. And so particularly when my brothers and I were young, we loved that hallway because it formed a kind of circle in the floor plan of the house. You'd, you could go straight, straight in the hallway, curve around, come to the dining room, back into the living room, back to the front door. And when we were very young, we would ride all our little pedal bikes or scooters or whatever it was around, probably tearing up the wood floors at the time, but racing each other in that circle. The hallway was kind of a room in the house, but it was kind of not a room. I don't remember ever actually sitting down 
in the hallway to eat a meal or play a game or read a book. But it did connect the other rooms. That was the purpose of the hallway. It connected the main rooms of the house. And I think of this passage I just read kind of like that. It's a, it's a hallway passage. It's a connector passage. It's a transition between the story of the raising of Lazarus. That was last week. That's the earlier part of John chapter 11. The, the, the raising of Lazarus and the, what's coming next week, the anointing of Jesus by Mary, the triumphal entry, and then into the final week of the last, the last week of Jesus' life. So this passage clearly points back to the raising of Lazarus, and it clearly points forward to the imminent death of Jesus. It's a hallway passage. It's a transition. And just like a hallway is important because it gets you from room to room, so this passage is itself very important. I see verses 45 to 57 as making two main contributions. First, these verses confirm the certainty of Jesus' imminent death. And then second, they highlight the purpose of Jesus' imminent death. In other words, it's going to happen. It's certainly going to happen. Jesus will die. This passage underlines that. And he's going to die for a reason. He's not going to die randomly. He's going to die for a purpose, for a reason. Now, John's already told us both of those things. We've already seen them multiple times in the course of the gospel up to this point. But he must think it's really important for us as readers to hear them again right before the death, right before we read of Jesus' final week and his crucifixion. Okay, so let's notice a death insured. These are on the back of your bulletin, these two points, and you can jot some notes there if you like. First of all, a death insured. Verse 45, some people, in fact, John tells us many people who have witnessed the resurrection of Lazarus, respond to it by believing in Jesus. They've just seen this incredible life-giving power that Jesus manifests when he says, Lazarus, come forth, and a dead man suddenly rises from the dead. These people have seen that happen with their own eyes, and they believe. Others report what has happened to the Pharisees, and we're not told their motives for doing that. But it seems to be another instance of this split reaction to Jesus that we've been noticing throughout the course of the gospel up to this point. And remember, we were told about it all the way, way back in John chapter 1, verses 11 to 12. Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John, John told us this was going to happen in the prologue. He said, there's some who are going to reject and some who are going to receive. Some who are going to believe, some who are not going to believe. A bunch of people see the exact same thing. The exact same thing. And they have very different reactions. And obviously that's still the case today. The name of Jesus is spoken, the gospel is proclaimed, and some believe and some reject. This past Wednesday evening here at the church, we had a good group of people come out for our baptism class. It was encouraging. These are people in whom God has been working. God has drawn them to saving faith, and now they want to be baptized as a profession of their faith. They heard the gospel, they heard the name of Jesus, and they have believed. And many of you, if you're in life groups, know that we recently hosted Christianity Explored in those life groups. We had a number of guests come and hear the gospel, and a number of those guests did not believe. One woman left after one session, and she said, this isn't for me. So it's still happening today. Some believe, some don't believe, some receive, some reject. People hear the same Christ, they hear the same gospel, and they have differing reactions. And this passage reminds us that when people don't accept the gospel, it's not necessarily because we've done something wrong. They heard Jesus, they saw Jesus himself, and some rejected him. So the fail for us is not when people say no, The fail is when we don't invite them, 
when we don't present the gospel to them, when we don't share the name of Jesus with them. All right, having heard about Lazarus' resurrection, the religious leaders, this is the chief priests and the Pharisees, call together the council. This, This is the Sanhedrin. It's the ruling body of Jewish leaders. It was ultimately under the authority of the Romans, but the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish council, had a lot of say in the affairs of the Jewish nation. The council discusses this problem that Jesus has become. Verses 47 and 48. They ask, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. The place they're talking about is the temple, and the nation is the people of Israel. So, in other words, they have political concerns. Here's their concern. If we let Jesus raise a crowd, he's kind of presenting like a Messiah, a political leader. The Romans might get concerned about this stirred-up messianic belief They might perceive it as some kind of an insurrection, and they might crack down on it. And when they crack down on it, it might bode ill for the temple and for the nation. Now, of course, in hindsight, on this side of these events, we recognize, ironically, that all that happened anyway. The Romans did come in AD 70, and they destroyed not just the temple, but Jerusalem. And they did it even though... The religious leaders got their way, and Jesus was crucified. I think what we're meant to see here is that Jesus' gift of life to Lazarus, earlier in John 11, his climactic seventh sign, Jesus' gift of life to Lazarus ensures death for Jesus himself. Verse 53, so from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Now, of course, this desire of the religious leaders to kill Jesus is not new. We've seen it many times already up to this point in the gospel. Let me just refresh your memory by mentioning a few of the passages that talk about the religious leaders' desire to kill, not just to arrest, but to kill Jesus. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, John 5, 18. Or chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Seven nineteen. has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Or seven twenty five. some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, is not this the man whom they seek to kill? 837, I know that you are offspring of Abraham, Jesus says, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. Do you see this repeated drumbeat over and over again? This is not new, what's happening here in John 11. This has been voiced numerous times, and Jesus knows it. Jesus knows their intention. And, and, And I just wonder whether we don't spend enough time thinking about this. What thinking about what this would have meant for Jesus to know for for an extended part of his life that there were people and powerful people who wanted him dead. I'm just not sure we think enough about that. That would have been part of the suffering of Jesus, to know that his life was desired by those who could do it, who had influence to do it. I've been praying uh, this last week for a friend of mine, a a pastor who shared with a group of us that there's someone um, in his, formerly in his church, kind of a disgruntled former member who is spreading slander in the community and going to other churches and slandering him in, in his church. And when I heard that, I just felt really bad for him and I've been concerned for him and praying, praying for him since then. But, but then I think about what Jesus experienced and multiply that by a thousand. Jesus lived a, a portion of his life knowing that there were people who hated him so much that they wanted to kill him. This desire to kill Jesus is nothing new, but it seems that Jesus' raising of Lazarus clarifies and 
crystallizes and heightens and formalizes the desire of the religious leaders to take him out. Verse 53, from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. So in raising Lazarus, Jesus is signing his own death warrant. He gives someone else life and he gets death. Does that sound familiar? Jesus gives someone else life and in return, he receives death. Of course, though, we have to remember what Jesus said back in John chapter 10, verses 17 through 18. And man, we got we, we to gotta just keep on reminding ourselves of this as we move into the second half of John's gospel and as we encounter the, the Passion Week, the crucifixion, Jesus' entombment. In, in all those, uh, we're, we're reading all that story. In, in all of that, it seems like Jesus is lacking control. He's lacking agency. But Jesus says here in John 10... None of this is just other people plotting against me. None of this is is ultimately other people determining what's going to happen to me. I am choosing every detail of what's coming. Here's what he says in John 10, 17 to 18 to remind us. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. And I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So, Jesus is in full control of the events of his passion, of his death. No one takes his life from him. He chooses to lay it down. In verse 54, we see him waiting, biding his time with his disciples in a town called Ephraim. It's not that he's afraid of being killed. He's not trying to muster up his courage to finally make it to Jerusalem. No, 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 not at all. Jesus is in control, and he knows the Father has a time for him to lay down his his life, and that time is not yet here. So he's waiting until the time has come. He's in control of events. Verses 55 to 56 describe the imminent Passover And the curiosity of the crowds about Jesus and whether he's going to come up to Jerusalem, the answer is he will when it's time. He's in control of events. Verse 57 reveals that the plan of the religious leaders is to use the crowds to locate Jesus. There are apparently no CCTV cameras yet to do that job. Now, the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was... He should let them know so that they might arrest him. The arrest is simply a means of killing Jesus because they've already decided what they're going to do with him. And one commentator rightly says, Jesus is not to be arrested in order to be tried. He is to be tried because he's already been found guilty. They've already made up their minds. This is going to happen. It's going to happen. They've made plans now. But it's not just going to happen because they've made plans. It's going to happen because Jesus is going to lay down his life. Jesus is going to surrender his life. And so on multiple levels, this is a death insured. It's insured by the religious leaders. And much more than that, it's insured by the plan of God. But John doesn't just present to us the bare, brute fact of the certainty of the death of Jesus. John makes sure that we know what it means, why it's going to happen. He's preparing us as we're coming to read about it in just a moment. And he does this in a surprising way by showing us a redemption prophesied. The Sanhedrin, the ruling council has gathered. They're discussing what to do about Jesus, verses 49 and 50. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. See, Caiaphas is thinking and speaking and planning on a purely pragmatic political level. And this is a viewpoint formed not from moral considerations, but from practical ones. 
If Jesus grows in popularity, we've already seen this, if Jesus grows in popularity and the crowds follow him and there starts to be some unrest and some thinking that Jesus is the Messiah and that maybe he'll throw off the Roman yoke, the Roman overlords, then Rome might get concerned, they might get worried, they might send troops, they might do some destroying, and things won't go well for Jerusalem or for the religious leaders. This is the the kind of expedient, political, pragmatic thinking that John highlights a little bit later in John 18, 14, when he thinks back, when he refers back to this episode. He says it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. So obviously this has nothing to do with spiritual redemption. In in Caiaphas's mind, this is just practical, pragmatic, survival thinking. Let's do what's best for us. And importantly, it's about preserving vested interests, the vested interests of those who are powerful and elite. So look again what he says in verse 50 to the religious leaders. He says, it is better for you that one man should die for the people. For you. In other words, the, the leaders have power and wealth and influence, and the status quo will be best maintained if Jesus is gotten out of the way. You can understand what Caiaphas says in verses 49 to 50 at that purely pragmatic political level. In fact, that's how Caiaphas understands what he says. (laughs) That's all he knows about what he's saying. And this is where the passage gets really remarkable because John tells us that something much more is going on in Caiaphas's words. Look at verses 51 and 52. Caiaphas did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. In other words, Caiaphas speaks better than he knows. John tells us, verse 51, he did not say this of his own accord. Instead, he prophesied, which means that Caiaphas' words are God's words. They're God's interpretation of what's coming in the death of Jesus. When Caiaphas says that one man should die for the people, he's making a political point. If Jesus dies, the people likely won't. If he's gotten out of the way, the Romans won't have a cause to crack down on Judea. But that little preposition for, he says, it's better that one man die for the people. That little preposition is very important. In fact, it's precious. It's used elsewhere repeatedly in John's gospel in passages that refer to the death of Jesus. And in those passages, that little word for, a death for someone else is not just about political expediency. It's about spiritual redemption. Let me show you a few of those passages. John chapter 6, verse 51. These are the words of Jesus. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Do you you hear what Jesus is saying? My flesh will be crucified. I'm going to give my life. I will give it for, for the life of the world. I'll give my body in behalf of, in place of, for the sake of, in order to spiritually redeem those who will trust in me. John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A good shepherd puts himself between the bear and the sheep, between the lion and the sheep, sacrifices himself. A good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Or John chapter 10, verse 15, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. 
or John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Caiaphas doesn't even know it, but he's prophesying something. He's prophesying of the sin atoning death of Jesus, the substitutionary atonement of the Lord Jesus. Jesus will give his flesh for the life of the world. The good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. Jesus, the best friend anyone ever had, will give his life in our place. And Jesus' death will redeem not just the Jewish people who choose to believe in him, but also the children of God who are scattered abroad. That is God's people among the Gentiles. This is what Jesus will talk about in John chapter 12 when he says, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself, all people to myself, not just one nation, but people from every nation. This is really important. When Caiaphas unintentionally prophesies that Jesus will die for the nation and to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad, his words ascribe purpose to the death of Jesus. Do you hear the purpose? He, he will die for someone. That's purpose. He'll die to unite one people of God in order to. The, the, the little word there is a purpose word. He'll die for a purpose in order to bring Jew and Gentile together into one nation, one people. There's purpose in Jesus's death. In other words, Jesus didn't die simply because Judas betrayed him or because the Roman soldiers pounded nails or the Jewish leaders managed to make good on their, their scheme to get him out of the way. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't the only, the only reason Jesus died. He died, he laid his life down for a reason with a purpose. And why is that important? Well, because, I mean, it's hugely important. His death wasn't random. It wasn't an accident. His death conveys love because it conveys purpose. Jesus died to lay his life down for you if you trust in him. He, he did it with a reason in mind. His life wasn't taken away from him. He chose to surrender it for you. So when you read this story, you should feel the love of Jesus for you. The great poet George Herbert, whom I overquote, <laughs> says in his poem, The Agony, he's writing about the cross and the Lord's Supper, love is that liquor sweet and most divine, which my God feels as blood, but I as wine. The death of Jesus is love, it's an expression of love, and it expresses love because it was purposeful. He did it for his reason and for God's reason. So not only is his imminent death certain, it also has a purpose, which is redemption. And the presence of that purpose shows us the love of Jesus. The cross shows love. I want to close with one question that I've not yet answered. I raised it, but I've not answered it. And I actually don't know the answer to this question. Why would God choose to do it this way? I mean, why, why would he choose... Right before, in this gospel, right before the Passion Week and the death of Jesus, why would he choose to highlight the meaning, the purpose of that death through the words on the lips of Caiaphas, uh, through an unintentional prophecy? Why would God do it that way? Uh, the reason I don't know is because we're not told. But I do notice that John specifically highlights in verse 49 the fact that Caiaphas was the high priest that year. So I, I wonder whether God wants to place the testimony to Jesus and to the meaning of his death on the lips of a respected leader so that maybe people later will come to believe in Jesus. Maybe Jews who respect that leader will believe what he says. Or perhaps God wants to demonstrate that he can take the words even of someone who is deeply, radically, existentially opposed 
to Jesus, and he can win glory for Jesus from those words and those lips. I don't know exactly why God chooses to do it this way. Maybe you have some ideas. Whatever his reason, we see here that as the Passover approaches, Caiaphas, the high priest, unintentionally points to a far greater high priest and to a far greater Passover lamb, one whose death will make atonement for sin and create one new people for the glory of God. This passage is a hallway. It it gets us from the raising of Lazarus earlier in chapter 11 to the final week of Jesus' life in chapters 12 and following, and it prepares us to read those events with a lot more insight. We know already it's going to happen. It's it's sure. It's the plan of God, not just the plan of man, but the plan of God. And we know that it will happen not randomly, but with a reason, with a purpose. I want you to hear this one more time. Here's the flow of thought from John chapter 11 into John chapter 12 and following. Life for Lazarus means death for Jesus. Death for Jesus means life for you. Resurrection for Lazarus ensures the crucifixion of Jesus. The crucifixion of Jesus is his own plan to ensure resurrection for you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you followed the plan of the Father. Thank you that you were faithful unto death. And we receive that as love. Love is that liquor sweet and most divine, which my God feels as blood, but I as the wine of the communion table. Lord, I pray that if anyone here hasn't heard this message, that there was a perfect high priest and a perfect Passover lamb who gave his life for them in their place. They would hear that right now in this moment, and you would bring spiritual life. You died for your people. You died to gather your people into one redeemed people. So would you do that even now, Lord? If anyone's just hearing this for the first time, has never put these things together, Would you welcome them into saving faith and into eternal life? And for those of us who maybe are fearful, maybe those of us who are anxious, and there's lots of things swirling in our lives, we need some reassurance. Would you reassure us this morning of your care for us, your love for us, your presence with us because of what we've just seen in this passage? You died not randomly, but with a purpose, and it was for us. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please rise and worship our God of unfailing love. of sin 
UCF Kids and Adult Ed is off for the summer, so you have extra time after this service. If you'd like to stay, hang out, catch up with one another, love for you to do that. And also, anyone who would like to pray, we'll have our prayer group going just underneath this room, underneath the sanctuary in the prayer room downstairs. Uh, Parents of kids, if you want to be part of the parenting discussions that are happening later in the summer, remember to pick up your free copy of Paul Tripp's parenting book. Uh, just on the table by the back back door. And then Brian, as Brian reminded us earlier, we'd love for people to sign up for those work teams for a week from today, service Sunday. Receive the benediction now. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>